I have a title this morning's sermon, The Fields of Harvest. The Fields of Harvest. Please stand for the reading of the word. Acts 11, verse 1 through 24, New American Standard Bible. Now the apostles and brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. And when I had fixed my gaze on it and was observing it, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth and the wild beasts and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and everything was drawn back up into the sky. And behold, at that moment, three men appeared at the house which where I was staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea. The Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. These six brethren also went with me, and we entered the man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is called Peter, brought here. And he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and your whole household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us, also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should stand in God's way? And when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of the men of Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord, for he is a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. Please be seated. The title of the sermon is The Fields of Harvest. The Fields of Harvest. I, I got to ask this question. I, I would like to know from you whose field you are in. Whose field are you in? If you and I were to sit down and draw a large rectangle on a piece of paper right now or flip over your notes and just begin to list all the people you know, both saved and lost, that rectangle you drew, I would pray, would turn out to quickly be too small. And that you should quickly migrate, not to a piece of paper, but into Miss June's classroom and wipe off her, her whiteboard and start listing even more names. Amen? Why? Because that is this field of harvest for you and your life and where you're at. You have, a, you have an entire regiment of people in your life, both saved and unsaved. Amen? Amen. You have friends and family. You, you have people that you don't even know that maybe you meet in the marketplace. But I promise you this, each one of you has a list of names in your heart right now of those who need to be born again, those who need ministry in their life. And I would pray that list would grow so big that a small piece of paper just wouldn't suffice. Amen? Why is that, Chuck? Because God's list isn't just for Jews alone, is it? Who is it for? Anyone and everyone who come to faith, right? We were learning about that this morning in, 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 in Wayne's Bible study, that the faith of Abraham has become the faith of who? Anyone who walks in that form of faith, amen? I need it. You need it. Sometimes we think like the early disciples did. We put our limits on God, and we fail to see the largest scope of his vision, and the field's white and ready for harvest. 
There and lays the issue. I, I and you, we have our own views. We have our own desires. We have our own wants and we have our own needs. And I want to be in my field. But saying to God, that is not what God wants for you. That is not what he wants for you. You and I will never discover the will of God until we capture his view, until we get a hold of his desires, and we get a hold of his wants, and fulfill the commands he has given to us. I'll say that again, fulfill the commands he has given to us. I cannot escape this saint, and I will tell you this church, that it just seems to resonate within everything that I read lately, the fulfillment of his word. Not merely knowing his word, but fulfilling it and doing what it tells us to do. Jesus came and lived on this earth. Would you say he had faith? Would you say that Jesus, anything he spoke, would come to pass? Yes, yes. And he had faith, right? He had faith. Yes. And he just didn't do anything. Say again. I, I will say this, Jim, but what did he do? What did he physically do? He had faith. Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. And you don't do anything? Is that faith? No, according, according to James, faith without works is death. So you have dead faith. That, that's, look, when you do nothing with your faith, it's dead. Jesus went about healing people. Jesus went about ministering to people. Jesus was involved in people's lives. And when they had the opportunity to share with someone who needed to be confronted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know what he did? He gave them the word. That's what he did. That's what he was about to do. Abraham, he believed God. He had faith. And what did he do with it? He got up and he went and he did something. Amen? I need his will. I need, if you want to discover the will of God, get a hold of his desires. I mean that. You get a hold of the desires of God and what he wants, you will find yourself in his will. Look at Philippians 2, 19 through 21. Philippians 2, 19 through 21, New American Standard Bible. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may incur be encouraged when I learn of your condition. So Paul has a heart to know where the Philippians are at, where in their walk. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. So, so Paul is genuinely concerned with whose welfare? Their spiritual well, Who? The Philippian church. So who does he send? Timothy. Hmm. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. Oh, did you know that Jesus has his interests? Well, you have your interests. I have mine. But don't you know, are we going to be concerned about what Christ is interested in? How am I going to know what he's interested in, Chuck? Get a hold of his desires. And you will find out what he's interested in. Amen? It should become quickly apparent the Lord your God has placed you in the lives of other people. This is your ministry. This is where God has placed you for a specific purpose and during this very specific time and where you find your life. How do you know that? Well, look at Acts 17, 22 through 31. So Paul stood in the midst of the Arapacaeus, oh, say that, Arapagus, and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all aspects. And respects. For while I was passing through and examining the object of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you the God who made the world and all things in it. Who did that? So he made who? He made you? He made me, right? The God who made the world and all things in it. So everything out there that you see, who made it? God. He is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and breath of all things. And he made from one man, what? Every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having look, here's the scripture, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Where do you, where, what's the boundary of your habitation right now? My, where, where are you living at? Yeah, I want to, I, I'm, I'm looking for it. Where do you live at? <coughs> you live in Glens Ferry? Yeah. Hammett? Yeah. Mountain Home? Doesn't matter where you live, does it? Yeah. You live, you're living in, in Mountain Home right now, Carlos, because God told you 
and you, you're supposed to be here, amen? I'm here because he told me I was supposed to be here. He appointed it for me. My sphere of influence, your sphere of influence. Why? Why did he do this? Verse 27, that they would seek God where you're at. If perhaps they might grow for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. And even as some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of a man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God has now declared to men that all people everywhere should repent. One of my favorite words, amen. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Who's he speaking of there? Jesus. Jesus. Look, even as God took Adam and placed him in the garden of his creation to tend it and to take care of it, so he has done to you. He has done the same to you. He has placed you where he wants you to be so that you will tend it and take care of it. Then again, too often, we only think of the lost when we begin to think about this, don't we? When it certainly comes to ministry. But if you look closely here in Acts 11, you see the Lord is also concerned about the attitudes of his own and what they think is true, but is not. The things that Peter thinks, and even all of his buddies, right? They think that, Gentiles are still considered what? Unholy? You shouldn't be hanging out with them? Don't go to those people, even though they're in your life. Don't go ministering to those people. Only to who? Jews. And that attitude was what? Wrong. I got to tell you, Saint, there is a permanence amongst the church today that refuses to allow you to go and minister or hang out with certain groups of people. Should I name them? Don't want me to name them, James? Don't name them. Don't go hanging out. Whatever you do, don't go hanging out with Church of Christ people. You'll never minister to those people. They don't need the Lord. Yeah, they do. Buddhists, drunks, drug addicts. Anybody? Bikers. Oh, God, please, not the bikers. Those hunter types. Right? I, you, you and I, listen, you and I, we need to get a vision for what God sees. And you know what he sees? Souls. He sees people who are in desperate need of a Savior. You have people in your life right now, no matter where they came from, no matter their background, no matter who they are, they need a Savior. They need to hear the message of the gospel, but that's somebody else's job. You're in a... You're in this place and this time for a purpose and a reason. And continue to walk away from it and not to take it personal, you need to. And if you can't, then you need to begin praying that God can minister to them through someone else. Amen? How are they, how are they ever going to hear the message if they never hear it? That's impossible. That's never going to happen. They need someone to go to them and preach to them and talk to them about salvation, don't they, Scotty? I need that in my life. You need that in your life. You need this right now, amen? Or else the Lord would not have put it on behind. Maybe it's for me. Maybe it's for, Someone here needs this message this morning. Miss Lord, I got to tell you what. I, we were reading this morning. One of, one of the things that Abraham was absolutely blessed in and how he received the vision and, 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 and the direction of where he was to go and what he was to become. You know how he got a hold of that? Being in the presence of God. Being in the presence of God. How are you ever going to get into the presence of God? How do you do that? Well, we did it this morning, amen? And we're doing it right now. It needs to be as a product of what? Of your worship of God? Of honoring Him? Of exalting Him? Of coming in, into a place like this? Or gathering together somewhere and lifting His name up and glorifying Him? And then what's the other part of that? We're hearing the Word. Amen? How, uh, uh, read publicly taught, preached, however, you get into fellowship. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you walk into any other uh, place that is non-Christian. Let's take a baseball game. 
Okay, or foot. What's coming up next? Football, right? Football's coming up. You get you get thousands of people. None of them know each other, and they're focused on one thing. What? The game. And they are absolutely united. And and what do they do when bad things happen? They all just sit back and don't do anything. No. When the, when the other team scores, woo! They're all look. What are they? What are they doing? They're absolutely united in a focused point of contact of where they are at in the moment. It's the same thing within a church, albeit that it's for good. You come into a situation like this and you gather with other Christians, you know what you're going to do? You're going to be built up. You're going to be strengthened. You're going to be encouraged. You're going to get what God needs for you to get. Amen? He may be speaking to some, something to you totally that, that's just related to this or something's not. It doesn't matter. The Lord will speak to you when you hear his word, when you hear his word, not mine. Amen. So be encouraged in that. I, and what I'm saying to you, we need to be in what? Fellowship. We need to be in worship together. Amen. There are some people now, they're getting it from a TV set. And I got to tell you, there's something about personal interaction in your life. You can't interact with the TV. Amen. You can't. You cannot interact with the TV. You cannot get the kind of fellowship that you need through a boob tube. It's not going to happen. Look, the point is, is that the Lord has to deal with his own body sometime and their attitudes. And he had to deal with Peter and some other disciples and their attitude about their willingness to go and fellowship with people who needed Christ. They only wanted to give it to Jews. And Peter gets this huge vision of what? Oh, all kinds of great food. Amen. What we would call great food anyway is Gentiles, right? Because most of us in here will eat just about anything. Amen. True. We want it fried, we want it pickled, we want it any way we can get it. If it's got the word food, like my dog, you know, Newton. I, I, maybe I've told you this before. When we first got Newton, you know, he was an abused dog. But man, what a smart dog. And, and we would feed him his food. He had these little vitamin bites in there, right? And he would go and collect them all up. He wouldn't eat those. He would, he would collect them in his mouth and then go drop them on the floor. And I got to tell you, the dog's got to be a genius because every time he dropped them, they were in perfect geometric shapes. <laughs> they were in perfect lines, squares, rectangles, you, you name it. It always seemed to land in a perfect geometric shape. And so Julie and I struggled for a long time trying to figure out, is the dog trying to communicate something to us? <laughs> And we would literally go up there and look at his dog food as it's laying on the floor, trying to read them like tea leaves or something to see if there's something in, some kind of special message in there. And it finally dawned on me what he's trying to tell us. No, no, because he always went back and ate those things. He, yeah, but, but the reality was, Julie says, Chuck, do you, do you know what he's trying to say to us? I was like, yeah, I know what he's trying to say. She goes, what? I goes, more meats. dog loves meat, man. Look, the Lord loves you. And he's trying to communicate to you. You have people in your life right now. You have a sphere of influence in your life right now. And he's trying to communicate to you and, and to me. Amen. This isn't just for you. Peter's confronted in his attitude and his unwillingness to associate with those he considered unholy and unclean. But look what the Lord does. He gives him a new vision, right? Literally, he gives him a new vision. He gives him a word of confirmation and then a practical, practical experience of putting it to work. What are you talking about, Chuck? Well, listen, he gives him a new vision. What was the vision? Well, the sheet hanging down. It came down full of, full of animals he's never eaten. Go eat that stuff, Peter. Go get up, kill it, eat it. No way, Lord, I'm not touching that stuff. I never put that stuff in his mouth. Well, that happens three times, and he's like, man, I wonder what that meant. And then all of a sudden, he's got a knock at the door, and he sees three Gentiles hanging out there. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit speaks to him. There's a word of confirmation. So he gets a vision and a word of confirmation from who? The Holy Spirit says, you go with those guys. Chuck's rough paraphrase. It's okay. Don't, don't think of them anything. You just go with them because this is from me. So now, so he's got a vision, he's got a word of confirmation, and then the practical application of now, well, somebody else will go minister to those people. I'll just sit here in my house. Is that what he does? 
No, he, his faith, look, he gets up and he goes with these guys and goes to a whole new place. And not only so, but he grabs several of his buddies and says, come with me. And they go and they begin to minister. That's the way it works. I need a new vision. You need a new vision. And then I need a, I need a word of confirmation in it that it's actually of God. And then I need to be about it and practically do it. I don't know. Is it the Lord calling? (laughs) You're okay. It's okay, Larry. So Peter's confronted with his attitude. Uh, what, What are you getting from that, Chuck? That the Holy Spirit, that the Lord cares about what you think. And what you believe to be true, doesn't he? And, and, and when, when you're wrong, guess what he's going to do? He's going to correct you in it. He's going to tell you the truth. He's always about telling the truth. So Peter gets it. He gets what the Lord is communicating. Then he shares it with others and the actual ministry occurs as a result. It doesn't stop there because Peter then has to defend his actions before the very disciples of the Lord. You will notice the ministry of the Holy Spirit is always present in the revealing of the truth of the Lord to the lost and to the saved. So the the Holy Spirit is always engaged in revealing the truth to who? Not just the lost, but also to who? Everybody. Even, Even his closest disciples still need education. They still need to be taught. And Jesus cares enough to do so through the Holy Spirit. See, the Lord has a ministry still. Say that again, Chuck. Uh, The Lord still has a ministry. And he still has a harvest field that he is still intimately operating in. And guess where he's put you? In In his field, not your own. Yes, even so, the Holy Spirit still has a ministry. And so do you. May he open our eyes and our hearts to see it. There is ministry within the body of Christ and there is ministry outside of it. But it will never occur outside of the ministry and the change of heart, mind, soul, and actions within each of us. It will never occur, I'll say that again, outside the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Christ in us to change our hearts, to change our minds, to change our souls and our actions within each of us and the things that we do. It is not just a matter of knowing the commands of the Lord, but to fulfill them. It's not enough just to know his word. You must fulfill them. How do you know this, Chuck? Well, look. Look at John chapter 14, verse 31 through 42. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. And he said to them, I have food to eat that you know not about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will. Look, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus is all about what? Fulfilling the will of God and doing what he's been sent to do. Hmm. I can learn from that. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that are white for harvest. Already who reaps is receiving his wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that he who sows and he who reaps what? May rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have not entered into their labor. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him. Why? Because of the word of the woman who testified. And he told all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there, what? Two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this is the one indeed, the Savior. Look, what happened? They heard the message twice. From who? From the woman? Remember the woman? This this is all about the story of the woman sitting by the well who wants a drink of water, right? So after Jesus gives her the truth, she goes and starts telling everybody about what had happened. 
And then they, they beg him. The Samaritans beg him to stay, hang out for two more days, and he does. And so what does he do while he's there? He preaches. He continues to present the word of God. Jesus had faith, but you know what he did? He did something with it. Amen? He presented the word before them. And then they believed not just because of the woman, but the confirmation of who? What Christ told them. Hmm. Interesting. I am here to fulfill the commands of the Lord. Would you repeat that with me? I am here to fulfill the commands of the Lord. I am here to fulfill the commands of the Lord. You are here to fulfill the very commands of the Lord. And in fulfilling the very word of God, we become fulfilled and our lives have purpose and meaning. What are you talking about, Chuck? Okay, so Jesus came on this earth and he lived this whole life. Had he received yet what, 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 he, what he was supposed to receive? Did he? While he was upon the earth, did he receive it yet? No. No. He had to live his life in faith, right? And he went about exercising that faith and doing everything he could in the name of who? His father. He actually presented God's name before anyone and everyone. By what? By healing them? Yes. That gave opportunity for him to what? To preach and teach more. Amen? He walked through this whole process and winds up going to the cross. But even in that, he has to walk by faith. Amen? And at the point that he goes to the cross and he dies, listen, at that very point when he, right before he gives up the Holy Ghost in his life, what does he say? It is what? It is accomplished. It is finished. And if you look deep enough in the Greek, you'll find that he's actually saying it is fulfilled. It is fulfilled. He fulfilled the command of God upon him to live his life and do what he was commanded to what? To do and to be. I can learn so much about that as a Christian. I am here to fulfill the commands of the Lord. You ought to write that on a piece of paper and stick it right on your, your, your mirror every morning so you have to look at it. Amen? You're here to fulfill his word. Look through the scriptures on your own. Take the time. Look through the four Gospels. And I, I, I challenge you to write down every time this statement that Jesus makes. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Jesus came to a, not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Now I have to ask you, do you think Jesus lived a life full of faith? Do you think he did that? Was he filled with absolute purpose? Yes. Did he have meaning and an everlasting impact upon the people within his field of harvest? Yes. He still does, doesn't he? Has he impacted you? Yes. Is he impacting you maybe even right now? Yes. See, you are his field. And as a result of being born again, he now puts you into his own field. The world, amen? He has you here for a purpose. Luke 24, 44 through 48. Oh, not there. Luke 24, 44 through 48. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Beginning where? From Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I, I find this so amazing because it's after his suffering and his rising from the dead on the third day. Then all of a sudden the ministry of what? Repentance of forgiveness of sins becomes the ability to be what? Proclaimed in his name. And now we are in that, that category. Matthew, uh, now, now then, when, when the disciples, what were the co disciples commanded to do? What were they told to do? Therein lies the mistake in my scriptures, okay? It should be Matthew 28, 16 through 20 and Mark 16, 14, 16 and verse 20. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. Same scripture that who was reading this morning? Hank. 
And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Not requested of you, commanded of you. Look at Mark 16, 14 through 16, and then verse 20. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he, he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he was risen. Think about that. He, 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 didn't, he didn't treat them kindly, did he? I mean, what does that mean right there? He reproached them. You know what that means? He corrected them. And he said, I can't believe that you didn't believe. I sent those people to you to tell them I was risen from the dead, and you chose what? You chose not to believe it. And now here I am, appearing before you, and now you what? Now you believe, oh, but Thomas. Oh, Lord, I, man, I, I know I see you standing here right before him, but unless I put my fingers in your hand and stick my, I'm not going to believe it. Here I am. Come do it. Get over your unbelief. Begin to believe, amen? He reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. I got, we got heart issues. Because they had not believed those he had seen after, after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world. Here's the, here's the command. Go into all the world and what? No, just sit in your easy chair. Whatever you do, don't, don't tell people about me. You let, that's somebody else's job. That is not what Jesus said to do. He said, go into all the world. And your part of the world is the field that he has you in right now. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, even to your dogs. Amen. Newton needs Jesus. <laughs> Miss D will love me for this. Your animals need Jesus. Miss D, you preach the gospel to them. Amen. All the creation, preach it to them. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be what? Ooh, condemned. Pick it up in verse 20. And they went out, listen, and they preached everywhere. They, what did they do? Exactly what they were told to do. Are they walking in faith? Yes. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them. Ah, oh. so listen, when I begin to exercise my faith and I begin to do what the Lord wants me to do, who's with me? The Lord's going to be with you. I, I see this in, in Acts chapter 11. Why? Because look, they, were, they just wanted to minister to Jews, and that was okay. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't okay. But there were those, those other guys, they got the full picture, didn't they? And they started ministering to who? Well, anybody who came along the way. And you know what the scripture says? That the Lord's hand was upon them and with them. And many people came to what? Believe. They became, they became believers because they were willing to go talk to who? Anyone and everyone. And while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by signs that followed. And they were, look, they're, look, so when, I, when, when I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm walking in faith, the Lord will confirm it through signs. Well, what are the signs? Well, people got born again. People got saved. Yeah, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues. They were gifted as preachers and teachers, ministers of helps, prayer warriors, givers. All those things occurred, amen? And guess what happened? The body was built up. More importantly, more importantly, harvest. The harvest of the field is occurring. People are working in the fields, amen? And they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus himself, who? Jesus himself sent out through them from the east to the west the sacred Listen, the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. I don't know why, but I love that portion of scripture right there. I just want to roll that around in my brain. Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. How long is this proclamation going to go on for? I want to be a part of that. You need to be a part of that. The signs that accompany belief as a result of fulfilling the word commanded. I'll say that again. 
the signs that were accomplished through belief as a result of fulfilling the word commanded. What has the Lord commanded you to do? What has he commanded you to do? I would suggest that we should follow that. Why? Because through fulfilling that and doing what we're commanded to do, you know what we're going to find? You're going to find the fulfillment you're looking for in your life. You're going to find a life that's worthy of living, amen? And the people around you are going to be fed, and they're going to come to Christ. They're going to come to Christ. By virtual obedience to the command of preaching the gospel, fulfillment is given to others and brings fulfillment to you. Why? Because you're working in the field. You're actually doing something. You're in the field of harvest. Look at 1 Corinthians 3. Well, I'm sorry, what is that? 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 11. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted Apollos water, but God was causing the growth. Who causes the growth? God will. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another's building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is who? Jesus Christ. That is the prime foundation that we're building upon. Verse 19 through 24. I'm going to read this scripture. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenician Cyprus and Antioch and speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them with all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And, he con and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. Barnabas, I'll look, as a result of obedience to the Lord, the church grows. That's what's going to happen. More and more people are granted repentance that leads to life, and the Lord sends encouragers. Specifically, in this case, Barnabas to minister to them. Barnabas sees the fulfillment of the grace of God upon them. How does he see that? How does he see the grace on them? They've changed. Their lives are changed. He sees them acting in Christian obedience and doing what God wants them to do. They're doing what he knows to be true as a Christian. And he sees it, and Barnabas' heart is overjoyed, and so he exercises the gift he has and encourages them with purpose of heart to remain true to the Lord. He is in the field, and he's working where he's been placed. How wonderful it would be for each of us to be known as good, as full of the Holy Spirit, and full of faith, just like Barnabas. There's a good goal in life, amen? I would challenge you, come, saints, come, follow and fulfill his command to you and enter his field of harvest. Enter the field. Get in involved. Pull weeds. Plant. Sow. Water. Do whatever God wants you to do. Amen? Just get involved and do something with your faith. Even Barnabas did that. I know he had faith. And when he heard, what did he do? He went to the body and he began to do and exercise the gift that he had been given. Amen? Matthew 20, 1 through 16. Listen to this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. And again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. 
And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received the what? A denarius. And when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more. But each of them also received the what? A denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, these last men have only worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go, but I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. What does this have to do with this portion of scripture? Well, you've been hired into the field. How long have you been in the field? Some of us have been in the field for a long time, amen? 72 years in the field. Some of us are just maybe getting here kind of recent. Amen? How much do you get paid, Lloyd? The same grace, the same faith, the same hope, the same love, the same salvation, the same forgiveness as anybody else who comes fresh into the field. Amen? But I need to be getting into the what? Get into the field. Get into the harvest field and do what God wants you to do. Exercise your faith. Yes, have faith. Believe that people are going to come to the Lord. Absolutely. But then do something with it. Amen? Follow it through. And then present the gospel if you're able. And if not, find somebody who, who can. Amen? Any other thoughts? Any other scriptures? Let's pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father. We're so grateful to you, O oh God. In every way, shape, and form, Father God, we see how your faith is always in action in the doing of it. By faith, you created the heavens and the stars, and you created something. You did something with your faith. You gave us love. You gave us peace and joy, happiness, Father, all the things that we desperately want from you. And we come to that through salvation in your Son, and we're grateful to you for it, O oh God. Only, Lord, teach us to put our faith to work. And to be about life and not about death, Father God. Help us, O oh God. Open our eyes to your fields. Help us to see them clearly, Father. Wait for harvest. And Lord, when we have the opportunities that we know that you're going to give to us, help us to exercise it by doing what you've called us to do and to be. Remind us of your holy word in those moments. Anoint us by your spirit in those moments. And Father, more than anything, tune the hearts of those who desperately need you, whether they're lost or saved. And give us the message that they need for the moment of the day and the time. Father, we love you so much and we're grateful to you for it. Lord, thank you so much for what you're going to do. And even though we can't see it, we know it's coming. We know it's coming. There's opportunities coming down the street this week. Maybe tomorrow, maybe today. Only help us to be tuned out, Father, to you and what you would have us to be and to do. And we worship you in it, Father God. We're asking you for souls. And we're asking you more for, for people in the field to to deliver them to you, Father, that you might be glorified and magnified. Let your name be proclaimed. Let your gospel go forth because it is eternal. And it brings eternity to those who hear, Father, and believe. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Yeah.